I suspect you have noticed this in your travels, um, but churches like to call their ministers different things, right? Uh, Epiphany, ever since I have been here, has been a place that likes to call its priest father. And I go along with that, that's fine. That's a term that I'm used to. But now and then, uh, here at Epiphany, I have people ask me if other things are okay. Um, particularly, some people like and feel a little more comfortable calling me pastor, Peter. In case you're wondering, yeah, that's just fine. I don't care about this very much. I'll even let you in on a bit of a secret this morning. You can actually just call me Peter. <laughs> I don't know about you, um, but most of the time I find other people's titles um, much more helpful and comfortable than any titles that people might use for me. I mean, for instance, I like calling my dentist uh, Dr. Rubino. Um, I have no idea even what his first name is. <laughs> of course, I insist on calling my bishop Bishop John. But when I think about the titles people like to put in front of my name, I am actually less likely to think about the honor that maybe they're intended to communicate. And more likely, much more likely to dwell on the responsibilities that they're attached to. Maybe you're like that as well. And you know, I know. I know, for instance, that Father does not work for everyone. In fact, I had somebody say to me once, I love this, they said, you're not my dad. But I actually find it a bit lighter to carry than the other option, and the option we're going to talk about this morning, the option of pastor. Now, why would that be? You know what pastor means, right? Pastor is actually just the Latin word for shepherd. It's a word that comes up a lot, many, many times in our scripture readings, this Good Shepherd Sunday. You were to pick up your handy Latin translation of the Bible, which I'm sure you all have in hand, because it's so useful in everyday life. Um, you would see this word pastor throughout our texts this morning. I mean, just to give you a sense of it, if we read Ezekiel 34, verse 1, it would say, The Son of Man prophesy against the pastors of Israel. That's actually the word it uses. Or if again, you look at Psalm 23, our psalm this morning, the first verse says, the Lord pastors me. And finally, if you look at John chapter 10, verse 11, our gospel reading, the last verse that we heard this morning, Jesus says, I am the good pastor. See, being a pastor, being a shepherd in the sense that the Bible repeatedly uses this term, It's a big deal. It's weighty. The title that ministers are called today is one they share with the likes of Moses in Isaiah 63. With Israel's priests, even those bad priests we heard about in Ezekiel 34 this morning. Kings. God calls King David to pastor, to shepherd his people Israel. God himself, of course, we heard in Psalm 23, the Lord is my pastor. And Jesus and John 10, the good pastor. Yes, you can call me pastor, that's fine. But just don't think by doing so you are choosing somehow a folksier, less weighty, less challenging title, at least for me. What I'd like to do this morning is talk a bit about the challenges here. Challenges actually not just for me, but for both of us connected to this word, pastor. Challenges that Michael and I take on as your pastors, your shepherds here at Epiphany. And secondly, challenges you face as members of the flock of God at Epiphany. I'm going to actually start with the challenges Michael and I face with this title of pastor. And to do that, we're going to look at Ezekiel 34 together. Um, There's a blue Bible in front of you. If you turn to page 722 in it, that will get you to the spot we'll be looking at together. Friends, one of the things that is tempting to do in Scripture sometimes is figure out a way to read ourselves out of the text so whatever is in it doesn't apply to us. This text here in Ezekiel 34 is really hard for pastors to do that with. In fact, I don't think there's any getting around it. This is very challenging for me as a pastor to read. I would think for pastors everywhere. 
Because potentially, at least, this passage is actually about us. It's about me. It reminds me that I have a high, some would say even impossible, calling to fulfill. And it's a calling that includes, just if we look at this text, starting in verse 3, not living off the flock, but living for the flock. And I have to say, I think that's an important thing for me to hear on this Stewardship Sunday. It includes, looking again at Ezekiel 34, strengthening the weak, healing the sick, binding up the injured, bringing back the strays, finding the lost, being gentle in my authority. These are all things those bad priests here didn't do, and they're being put out as things where they have failed. Not only am I reminded here in Ezekiel 34 that as a shepherd, as a pastor, I am called to these things. Honestly, I can't think about that without having to face the fact I only very incompletely do them. Not only am I reminded of that, but this passage reminds me that God is watching as I fulfill those tasks. If I do not take these responsibilities seriously, these weighty responsibilities, I could not read this text without coming to the conclusion I may hear God say what he says in Ezekiel 34.10. Thus says the Lord God, I am against the pastors, and I will require my sheep at their hand and put a stop to their feeding the sheep. I will rescue the sheep from my mouth, from their mouths, that they may not be food for them. That's sobering stuff. Sobering stuff for me and pastors everywhere to hear. If we fail to fulfill our calling, if I fail to fulfill my calling, Lock, will be taken from my care and given to someone else. Well, my guess is, is the sobering nature of that text for me is not much of a surprise for you. You know me well enough now, or I hope are getting to know me well enough, not just to know my strengths as a priest and a pastor, but also my weaknesses. You can probably think of one or more thing on this list that maybe I have not fulfilled. I do not always do these things for every one of you. I know that to be true. I cannot pretend the truth is otherwise. It may well even be that you sit here this morning knowing that there's been a time you've been weak, or wounded, or lost, and I have not been much help to you. If that's the case, I'm sorry. While I hope to do better, I know, and I hope you know, I will never be perfect at these things. I've failed. I'll fail again to be a good pastor. But still, the fact that this is hard, and it is hard, does not excuse me or any pastor here out of fulfilling it. So this is my part. When you call me pastor, this is the challenge that you're reminding me of. The great challenge of my life and vocation and the great reality that at the end I will have to answer to God for my care for you. Unless you're concerned uh, that this sermon was going to be all about me. <laughs> what about you? What does it take to be a sheep in God's sheepfold? We're going to look together at John chapter 10 as we think about that. That's page 896. So what are some attributes here of good sheep that Jesus describes in this passage? I think I find the first one in verse 4. And it's just simply this. They follow and listen to the voice of the good pastor. Just to be clear, uh, well, I really do hope you do not ignore me. Um, I am not the pastor that Jesus is speaking of here. Not the shepherd he's talking about. It's not me or any other human pastor in this passage. It's him. It's the good pastor, as he calls himself in verse 11, the ultimate shepherd of the sheep. So how do we do that? How do we follow and listen to the voice of the good shepherd? I know I just had you turn to John 10. Please stay there. Uh, but I think it's really helpful as we think about that part, that question of how we do this, 
just look briefly at Psalm 23 because I think it gives us a picture of that relationship and just a couple of quick compact points. I think it gives us a picture in Psalm 23 of what knowing and particularly following the Good Shepherd looks like. Just to kind of put it in a nutshell, I think what we see in Psalm 23 is that knowing and following the Good Shepherd means living a life that has God at its non-negotiable center. Following God along right pathways, Psalm 23 says. In other words, what we do with our lives actually matters, friends. There are right and wrong paths. And then knowing his presence, not just in those right pathways, not just when things are going great, but also in our darkest places, the valley of the shadow of death, Psalm 23 says. Recognizing that God is with us in those places as well is important. And finally, I think Psalm 23 reminds us that we take direction from God through Scripture, through the church, and even through human pastors. Not as an imposition or a concession, but as a comfort. Your rod and your staff, those instruments a shepherd uses to guide, doesn't say they bother me. It says they comfort me here in Psalm 23. So these are ways we know and follow the good shepherd in our practical lives. We're called to that. That's the first thing that I believe this passage says about good sheep, how to be a sheep, so to speak. Secondly, while sheep know the voice of the good shepherd and follow him, they do not listen to other voices. Jesus calls them thieves and robbers here in this text. Friends, there are a lot of people out there who look like pastors and act like pastors and even dress up in fancy clothes like pastors. Who claim the pastor in Jesus' name, but who are not actually doing that. It is your job to see that, to know the difference. So how do you do that? I think the first question we should all ask about those who have pastoral authority in our lives, and and friends, just uh, many of you I'm sure know this. I have a pastor too. That's what a bishop does for priests. He is my pastor, the person I look to for that sort of authority in my life. I think the first question we should ask of those people Are they doing and saying the kinds of things, or at least trying to do and say the kinds of things they think Jesus would say and do? Things the ultimate pastor, the model, would say and do. So listen to sermons. Watch attitudes and behaviors with your Bible in your hand and in the context of a community that knows Scripture to be God's Word. And yes, please be kind and gentle to pastors. Allow for misunderstandings. Allow for human weakness. Whether or not you are looking for it, you will find it, friends. But be wary. Be wary if you see patterns develop or positions consistently stated that don't seem connected with Jesus' example. At least an intent to be connected with Jesus' example. Everyone gets things accidentally wrong from time to time. I don't worry too much about that. I worry about people I think are purposely getting things wrong. Your responsibility as a sheep in the flock of God is to know who you are following and also to know who they are following. That is why it is so important, why we emphasize so much here at Epiphany that we all read Scripture, that we all have a life of prayer, that we all individually follow Jesus, not just Jesus says here in John 10, I know my own, and my own know me. There is no way to do that if you outsource all spiritual matters to a pastor, a human pastor in your life. And not knowing puts you in danger. Not every pastor follows the good pastor. Friends, yes, you need a human pastor. You you are not meant to live a life of faith alone. We need fellow sheep. We need to be in a fold. The only thing sadder than sheep in a fold that's confused is a sheep out wandering alone. So we need to be together. But our pastors, those we follow, need to be good pastors, not imposters. Not the thief or the robber of John 10. So 
challenges abound this morning, don't they? Both for you and for me. I do not say so myself. Being a shepherd, a pastor, is hard. It's a high calling. And when you choose, if you choose to call me Pastor Peter, please do not ever forget what you are saying. And I'll do my best not to forget it either. At the same time, being being in the flock of God, being a sheep has its own challenges. There are fake pastors out there. It is your job to know the difference. And if you don't spend time knowing Jesus through personal study of Scripture and prayer, through involvement in a community of believers, you are in a spiritually dangerous place. You may follow a thief or a robber straight out of the sheepfold. All these challenges are real, and they are real. There is one more thing I want to say this morning. There's a note of God's provision and grace, both for me and Michael as your pastors here at Epiphany, and for you as members of the flock of God in this place. And I, of course, want to conclude. And it's this. You see, friends, while I am your pastor, your shepherd in this place, all of these passages of Scripture remind us, remind us very clearly that I am not your only pastor. God promises something. He promises it in Ezekiel 34. This is outside of our reading, but I just think it's so important for us to see. So this is verse 15 from Ezekiel 34. He says, I myself will be the pastor, the shepherd of my sheep. I will seek the lost. And I will bring back the straight, and I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak. Do you see that? You see how God says he will fulfill all those things he says are lacking in those priests at the beginning of Ezekiel 34, in those pastors at the beginning of that passage. God says, I will do that. I will fulfill that need. I mean, what better backstop to human failings and human leaders could there be than God's own promise? pastor us. Friends, I am convinced that promise is for us as well. God is real. He acts. He will pastor us. Where I fail you, and I've been honest, and and I expect it's no great surprise, I will fail you as I'm your pastor. God promises you he will not fail you. He promises to be your pastor. And what grace and comfort there is for us in that. But God promises not only to be our pastor, your pastor, where human pastors fail. He also promises and fulfills his promise through Jesus Christ to do that by sending a lamb to the flock. I know that's a pile of sheep metaphors to try to untangle there. <laughs> They're biblical ones. In fact, this is a nearly a direct quote from Revelation chapter 7, verse 17, where it says, For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, their pastor, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The effect of all of this, both for pastors and for God's flock, is that we have his gracious promise to be with us all, to stand with each of us in our roles and responsibilities. Not only that, but to fulfill them where we fail. Sheep, you always have a pastor in Jesus Christ. No matter how human pastors fail you, no matter how you may fail to recognize good from bad. Shepherds, pastors, we also have a pastor, and he is the Lamb of God who not only laid down his life for the flock, but for us. All our work as pastors is in the end nothing but a representation and an enunciation of what he has already accomplished. An outworking of that completed offering of himself we celebrate at Easter. Yeah, Epiphany, you can call me pastor. No, know that being a good member of the flock of God means taking responsibility for knowing true pastors from false ones. Never forget that Jesus is our ultimate pastor. 
know his voice, follow him, both in paths of righteousness and through the valley of the shadow. Then surely his goodness and mercy will follow you all the days.